Public Forum, a student production. Your moderator is North Idaho College political scientist, Tony Stewart. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the panel, it is a very special privilege to welcome to our program this evening the Honorable Frank Church, the senior United States Senator from the state of Idaho. Senator Church holds a AB degree and LLB from Stanford University. He was Phi Beta Kappa while attending Stanford University. He also served in the Army in military intelligence in the countries of China, Burma, and India in, during World War II. In 1957, he received a very distinguished honor from the National JCs as one of the outstanding young men of America. In 1960, he served as the keynote speaker at the National Democratic Convention. Senator Church was first elected to the Senate from the state of Idaho in 1956 and was reelected in 1962, 1968, and 1974. At the present time, he serves as a member of the Senate Foreign Relations, Interior and Insular Affairs, and the Democratic Steering Committees. He also is chairman of the Senate Special Committee on Aging and chairman of the Senate Special Committee on Termination of the National Emergency. In the presidential election of 1976, uh, Senator Church was a candidate for the Democratic nomination and was very successful in those presidential primaries that he entered. You will also recall that he was on the list of the top five or six uh, candidates considered uh, by Governor Carter for his running mate. I think the distinction uh, of this particular senator can best be explained by a publication that came out in 1968 from Lip Opinion, in which they compared the Senate of 1850 with that of 1968. And if you, the viewers, will recall, in that Senate in 1850, such distinguished men served as Daniel Webster and Senator Paul Douglas, Henry Clay, and a number of others, excuse me, Stephen Douglas. They also compared that with 1968 and selected 12 senators that, it, that they thought were at the same level of ability. And among those 12 was our distinguished guest, the Honorable Frank Church. Senator Church, as always, it's a pleasure to welcome you to our program. Thank you. I'm glad to be back again. Joining me this evening in ans uh, asking the questions of our guests will be Mary Lou Reed, uh, Dr. Ken Wright, and Janelle Burke. We'll proceed to questions at once in the first series from Mary Lou Reed. Senator Church, this is the first chance we've had you back to talk to us since your brief bid for the presidential nomination in which you were successful in several states. And I'd like to ask you, as you traveled around and talked to the voters, what were the issues that seemed to be most upon their minds? What questions did they talk to you about throughout the country? Well, Mary Lou, um, it depended upon uh, the state, naturally. Um, in Nebraska, people were very much concerned about uh, farm problems, uh, concerned about small business, um, the kinds of things that uh, would crop up here in Idaho frequently cropped up in the questions that I was asked in Nebraska. Over in Oregon, uh, there were more people concerned about uh, the depressed conditions in the lumber industry and the high level of unemployment, the weakness in the economy. Um, out in um, Rhode Island, um, the concerns were uh, still different. Uh, large numbers of people were worried about um, the adequacy of, of the Social Security program in terms of retirement income, in terms of, of health care, improvements in health care. And uh, so I'd have to say that this is a very big country. And one of the things that struck me in the presidential campaign was how different um, the uh, conditions of life are and how different the problems are perceived from one, from one state to another. They seem to be co then concerned about their local issues and about the money issues. Were there any, any things that tied, seemed to tie the country together? Yes. There, there was an overriding concern, sometimes expressed in cynicism, sometimes expressed in apathy, sometimes expressed in anger, sometimes in disgust. Uh, but that was, uh, I would say, the legacy of Watergate, the feeling that uh, men in high office could no longer be trusted, 
um, the revelations, the big agencies of the government, in fact, the very ones, the FBI, the CIA, that we'd entrusted with so much power and permitted to function in so much secrecy, had been violating the law, interfering with the rights of American citizens. Uh, all of these revelations uh, naturally uh, had an alarming effect upon the public, and uh, we still feel that in this election. So I think there was a general um, belief everywhere that um, this had to be corrected. A sense of trust had to be restored again in the um, integrity of the political leadership of this country. And um, I think that uh, that I'd put on the top of the political agenda for any new administration. Thank you. Dr. Wright. Senator, 1976 represents the first time that you made a genuine attempt to run for the presidency, and I would assume that uh, you would probably consider doing so again. Uh, from the 1976 campaign, what, what kinds of things did you learn, and what would you do, do differently in the future? Well, as I look to the future, my, my crystal ball is a, is a bit uh, murky, Ken. Um, I don't know how far ahead I have to look and it's hard to tell whether or not I'll ever try uh, another race for the presidency, or whether circumstances will ever again permit me to, um, uh, to enter such a race. Um, if I had gotten into this race earlier, I think I might have stood a good chance of winning the nomination. Uh, I won in four out of the five states where I had a opportunity to conduct an adequate campaign and that uh, we were limited in finances we just couldn't make an impression in the big states having come in so late uh, and we nearly carried Rhode Island we almost made it five out of five but we were campaigning in Rhode Island over the over the um, Memorial Day weekend and everybody was out on the beaches or they weren't paying much attention to the primary election yet we came very close there so um, I think that if uh, another opportunity were to arise, uh, uh, one thing that I would do would be to get into the race early enough. This year, that wasn't possible. I had an investigation, an important investigation. I'd taken on that responsibility. I couldn't walk away from it. And uh, by the time I'd completed that work, uh, it was very late. And I had to try a late, late strategy. Uh, it might have worked but there wasn't room enough in it for two um, candidates, and there was no way to copyright it. And along came the governor of California as another late, late candidate, and uh, that, I think, made the, um, made the race impossible. By the time um, you divided up the votes that were left between a couple of late, late candidates, uh, there weren't enough to, to really stop the tide, and as you know, Governor Carter was able to secure a majority of the delegates through the primary process uh, fully a month before the convention began. But I have no regrets. You know, it was a great experience. I learned a lot about America. Uh, I had some good victories. Um, Athena and I um, look back upon the whole experience uh, uh, without, without a single regret. You mentioned timing is one of the problems, of course, and I'm sure that everybody would agree with you on that. Uh, and money, of course, is something else that gave you some problems. How important is money in a presidential campaign? I mean, what really, what percentage of the uh, of the campaign is just hinges on money? And is it possible to finance a presidential campaign through the, uh, the taxpayers? You know, by everybody donating well, a dollar tried, or two. We tried. We tried the um, the experiment. The experiment this this year, you know, under the new law of limiting contributions to $1,000 and then providing matching money um, for all contributions up to $250. And um, if it hadn't been for the fact that that law was challenged in court and the Supreme Court came along and, and there was a period when all of the money was withheld, um, it might have worked quite well. The trouble is, it takes a great deal of money to run for the presidency. I, I came into it late. I had to raise um, 
a million and a half dollars, which was, um, if Jimmy Carter will excuse me, peanuts compared to <laughs> <laughs> compared to what the other candidates raised and spent. Um, as I recall, Mo Udall uh, must have raised nearly four, four, four and a half million. Uh, Jimmy Carter spent over six, somewhere between six and seven million, as I remember. Uh, Ford and uh, Reagan, of course, spent uh, 11 or 12 million dollars, uh, possibly more. I, I, I just, I'm, but that's in the ballpark. Um, and so um, it takes a great deal of money to run for, for the presidency. Um, some of them came out um, heavily in debt. Um, we tried to run uh, the campaign on a pay-as-you-go basis. It's not possible. Um, we came out with a debt, not a big debt by presidential standards. We, we raised and spent about a million and a half dollars, and I think we have a debt of about $50,000, which I hope to get paid off by the end of the year. But um, money is the problem. Uh, I, I think the present law um, has much to commend it. It encourages small contributions. It makes a public contribution without which it wouldn't have been possible for me to run. Uh, the Supreme Court decision, however, uh, was, in my opinion, a rather strange one because it upheld the $1,000 limitation on contributions, which I think is sound public policy. But it said that for a rich man who had his own money, there was no limitation on how much he could spend electing himself, which is a very strange line to draw. It means that poor men who must rely upon contributions from their supporters are limited by a thousand dollar contribution from any given supporter, but a rich man who has his own money to spend has unlimited uh, resources available to his campaign. I hope some way that can be corrected in the future. Janelle Byrd. As a result of your experience as a candidate for President of the United States, do you feel the present primary and national convention method of selection is uh, the most effective means of choosing a candidate? Well, Ms. Burke, I uh, don't know whether it's the most effective, it's not the most efficient means, I know that. Um, and many propose uh, changes, regional primaries. It's, it's a long, hard, tortuous process. Uh, it's, a, it's a terrible uh, and punishing course, a kind of obstacle course uh, for any candidate because of the number of primaries. 33 or 34 now, and the fact that they come at different times and often um, spread the country. There may be one in the west, one in the midwest, one on the east coast on one weekend, <laughs> then the next weekend yeah, there's one in the south and, 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 and perhaps one in the, in the middle west. Um, and it's a very tough, long, hard, expensive uh, obstacle course for any candidate. And you can say it's irrational, and I'd have to agree. Different standards apply. State laws vary greatly in terms of how you qualify and how many may run. I was faced in Nebraska, for example, with a ticket filled with the most prominent Democratic names in the country. Men who weren't running. Men who'd said that they wouldn't serve if elected. Men who tried to get their names off the ballot. Men like Ted Kennedy and Hubert Humphrey. They were all on the ballot because the law said that the Attorney General or the Secretary of State, whomever, could put whatever names he pleased on the ballot. So there's much that's uh, peculiar about the system. But there's one great thing going for it. And all those who advocate reform have not quite persuaded me that their reforms would make up for this one virtue that I find in the present system. I don't know of any other country where a Jimmy Carter could come out of nowhere in the sense that he was not holding office in Washington. He had no longer 
the governorship of Georgia. He was a private citizen, not particularly well known to the country, in fact, known only in Georgia. And nevertheless, he was able simply by tenacity and good planning and because it was possible to run in all of these states to defeat a whole series of better known candidates who were part of the national scene. And um, I think that speaks highly for the vitality of the democratic process in this country. And the reforms that I have seen would tend to make it more difficult for an outsider ever to crack through. And I, I'd never want to see the president become the exclusive possession of those highly prominent national figures in that little arena that gets all of the spotlight from year to year. Senator Church, uh, since you are certainly known as an expert in foreign policy and have spent many years on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, General George Brown, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, has been most controversial recently with statements he's made about Great Britain and, and particularly about Israel. Uh, following those statements, columnist Jack Anderson, who indicated that he was very pro-Israeli, indicated, however, that there was some justification to some of the remarks by General Brown in that in having, in having the responsibility of providing a defense for Israel in many ways, that they had not been willing to show us the records as to the need of certain uh, defense items, and at some times during certain crises that our own defense had been probably seriously weakened by having the responsibility of, of providing them with a very heavy amount of arms. Um, this is very interesting coming from Jack Anderson, who's been very involved, uh, as we all know, in, in, in so many documents that have had merit in the past. How would you react to uh, the columnist's uh, remarks on the statement by General Brown? Well, I think that uh, we can make too much of um, statements that brusque generals make. Uh, I, I, I know that uh, General Brown has been very tactless from time to time. Uh, but um, he's also a, a man who blurts out what he believes. Now, I strongly uh, believe that it is in our interest in the Middle East uh, to furnish Israel to the extent that she may have the capacity to purchase weapons and through direct aid to the extent that she can't with the means to defend herself and preserve her independence as a free country in that part of the world. There are a lot of reasons why I think that is in the American interest. But to say it is not a burden <laughs> is, is, uh, is to misspeak the truth. Of course it's a burden. It's a burden we assume because we believe it to be in our national interest. In some ways, we increase the burden on ourselves. Uh, when we sell billions of dollars of the most sophisticated equipment to such countries as Saudi Arabia and Iran, selling them more advanced fighter planes than we have in our own inventories, selling them destroyers that are more sophisticated than we're purchasing for our own Navy, uh, when we sell uh, sidewinders and maverick missiles, uh, uh, laser-beamed controlled uh, smart bombs and all the rest to Saudi Arabia along with the fighter planes. Um, then you see we create a need for additional weapons in Israel. Uh, not because I think that Saudi Arabia is likely to go to war directly with Israel, but because those weapons are transferable. And if there's a new war in the Middle East, there's no one who can guarantee us that those weapons won't be transferred to Iraq or to Syria or to Egypt and used against the Israelis. The Israelis know this, so they feel a need to further increase their own weapons. And we, because of our commitment to them, uh, have to increase the level of aid to Israel. Isn't that a burden? Of course it is. Uh, one that may be self-generated, but a burden nonetheless. So I would have to say, uh, also as a good friend of Israel, but I agree with Jack Anderson on the point he made.
Mallory. Would you continue on this? What, what do you think Congress and the President could do to uh, change this pattern of arms sales to countries such as Iran and, and Saudi Arabia? Do you feel that there is a responsibility for the government to step in and to decide what the national interest is in, the, in that regard? I surely do. We don't have a national policy now. It's uh, being determined largely by the uh, munitions makers, the large um, aircraft companies, uh, Grumman and uh, Lockheed and the rest. You see, in investigating these sales through my uh, subcommittee on multinational corporations, we discovered some very interesting things. A few years ago, for example, uh, for example, uh, the Grumman Company was in serious financial distress. Um, the planes it was going to sell to the Navy, the F-14, um, was were not sufficient. The contract was not sufficient. The yield was not sufficient to rescue the company from impending bankruptcy. The Navy even had to make advance payments to try to keep the company going. So there was a desperate need on Grumman's part to find a foreign purchaser for additional planes. And they went to Iran, and through a very uh, intensive sales campaign, reaching just the right people, engaging uh, foreign agents, agreeing to pay them $24 million for the right decisions, um, all against the policy of the Iranian government, uh, which had uh, strongly condemned the use of agents, uh, managed to get the Shah greatly interested, his appetite whetted for this new F-14. And by the time our government came around to making a decision as to whether or not to make that plane available to any foreign power, the deck was so stacked in favor of selling the plane to the Shah that to have refused it to him would have created a very serious diplomatic rupture in our relations. Uh, so, the decision our government made, which was supposed to set the policy, was in actuality just a formality. The decision had been made by Grumman, by its uh, own sales campaign, by the Shah's own determination to have the plane, all before we even decided whether or not it was in our national interest to make that plane available. So, we don't have a policy now, not at all. It's worse than this. That's, uh, if you really look at it, you see what we're doing out there. Take Lockheed, for example. In my investigations, it's been acknowledged now by the Lockheed executives that they spend $105 million in corporate funds, in commissions and bribes, just to Saudi Arabians alone, to buy um, aircraft and other very expensive weapons from Lockheed. Now, $105 million? Think how many families were enriched, enormously enriched, with these under-the-table payoffs to get them to overbuy weapons which Saudi Arabia doesn't need, can't use, are way beyond the reasonable necessities of her defense. You see, uh, when you let the munitions companies determine the policy, which has been happening, um, well, then you have no policy at all. And uh, the end result will be that we will have sold a big war in the Persian Gulf. How long it will take in coming, no one knows, but it will come. Because if history teaches us anything, it teaches us that nations use their weapons systems once they have them developed and at the ready. It's just a question of time until the decision is made to go to war. And now, the, these weapons will never be used against the Russians. I mean, it's not, that's not the reason. Because uh, as big and as uh, modern as the Shah's forces may be, they, they, they would be little or nothing when it came to stopping the Russians, if the Russians were to invade that part of the world. So these weapons will finally be used in some kind of a regional war, either involving 
Israel once again, or a, or a war in the Persian Gulf, in the model of the India-Pakistani war, where we supplied the weapons to both sides, we were blamed by both sides afterwards, and the Russians stepped in as peacekeepers at Tashkent. We have no policy. I hope, I hope that we get one and, and bring this whole uh, runaway arms race in the Persian Gulf under some restraint. How serious is the, the munitions lobby, the combination of the military and and the munitions contractors and perhaps the, the workers and the congressmen who have uh, factories in their district. How, how hard would it be to get a policy through Congress? Would it have to be a, a presidential executive uh, move or, or do you think it could be legislated? To get the control over the magnitude of, of, of this uh, runaway arms uh, sales program, uh, it will take presidential direction and presidential determination uh, because now there there is no restraint upon it and uh, the corporate tail is wagging the national dog but there are some things that congress can do that, that will be helpful in fact some things that have already been done as a direct outgrowth of my investigations into this corruption which incidentally caused the far greater sensation in the world at large than it did in the united states i don't know whether we've become used to scandal or what, but uh, uh, in Europe and in uh, the Middle East and in, in Japan, these re revelations uh, uh, have shaken governments and have caused the first serious investigations in Japan and in the Netherlands and in Italy to take place since the end of the war. Um, we have passed legislation already. It's a part of the Arms Sales Act this year that requires that these big arms companies for the first time list all of their commissions and all of their fees uh, paid to foreign agents engaged in promoting arms sales. Now, they, that information must be made available to the Securities and Exchange Commission, must be made available to the State Department, the Pentagon, and to certain committees of the Congress. I think that these disclosure requirements will certainly help to cure the excesses uh, because it will now be possible to compare the amount paid to a single agent with what he might legitimately do for that money and uh, thus pinpoint the, uh, the questionable cases. So it's a step. It's a step. It's a step and made already uh, as a result of the investigations. Dr. Wright. Senator, since we're on the topic of uh, arms races and weapons, System, but let's continue into that a little deeper here. Uh, we're continually reminded of the fact that the Soviet Union is engaging in a tremendous naval buildup at this time, and we're told that our Navy is, if not already, probably will soon be inferior to the Soviet Navy, and we're continually reminded that our bomber system is antiquated and out of date. B-52 is uh, too old to be a very workable bomber anymore, and Obviously, uh, the new topic now is going to be the B-1 bomber system. Should we or should we not you know, go into this thing heavily? Where do you stand on this particular issue? Well, I, I'm concerned a bit about the Navy. Uh, every power that wants to be in, an imperial power builds a big Navy. Uh, we have one. And um, the Russians are getting one. Uh, the, the attention that they're giving to um, uh, air, aircraft carriers uh, is an interesting new development. Uh, it may be that they're just imitating us. There's a good case to be made that the aircraft carrier is the most uh, a vulnerable and least useful weapon uh, left in uh, the Navy. And uh, maybe the Russians are, are, are going to make the same mistake that we have made in, in building and maintaining so many of them. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, there's, there, there's clear evidence that the Russians are building up a very formidable uh, navy. I don't worry much about the B-1 bomber, except for the fact that we may be foolish enough to build it. Um, <laughs> we've gone beyond the manned bomber, uh, period. The new weapons are of an entirely new generation. Uh, the, the, new, the new weapons are not only the ballistic missiles, uh, which can 
reach in 30 minutes what it takes hours and hours and hours for a bomber to reach. Uh, but the guided missiles, the smart missiles and so on, um, that can reach their targets um, with uh, uncanny accuracy after going through uh, various evasive uh, courses that make defense against them extremely difficult. That's the new generation of weapons. Why are we thinking about spending a hundred million dollars on a bomber plane, one bomber plane? A hundred million dollars. What could it possibly add to our defense that anywhere compares with the price? And when we get them built, they'll all be obsolete. Why should we insist upon building uh, the 20th century version of the Spanish Armada? <laughs> I don't understand it. I understand the vested interest, of course. The machinery is pretty well in gear. Uh, sure, the aircraft, program, the aircraft really. companies are there. They need big, expensive planes to put on the production lines. The unions are there. The jobs will, the jobs, uh, will, will, um, will be an issue. But you know that's an awfully, I'd like to know how much we pay for each job when we're putting out a hundred million dollars for every bomber. No, um, we have to rethink our defense and we have to uh, bring it into line with, with the new technology. Uh, and, I, and I hope that uh, we will begin to do that soon. What's your crystal ball tell you about the prospects for, for stopping the B-1 bomber program? depends upon the president. Uh, there isn't enough um, resistance in the Congress to the kinds of pressures that will be brought to bear for the Congress to, um, to turn it down in my judgment. I think that Congress or the Senate did very well in managing to postpone the decision until another president gets a chance to look at it considering how hard the Senate was pressed to go ahead and make the decision and not gear the new administration should uh, we have one in January. Um, the chance to decide. Janelle Burke. With regard to intelligence agencies, both internal and international, how is the national security to be preserved with integrity? We have all been aware of times when the security agencies have engaged in illegal activities. How can we preserve our national security with integrity, and how informed should the American public be? How much right do they have to know what is going on with the uh, security agencies? We set up the CIA to spy on foreigners, not on Americans. When they spy on Americans, Americans should know about it. Uh, we set up these agencies to operate within the law. Uh, when they uh, conspire to murder foreign leaders, uh, they should be stopped, their activities exposed. Nobody has a right to commit murder. In times of peace, the President of the United States is not a glorified godfather to decide about who's going to get murdered. And uh, we'd better get that straight. So these agencies must operate within the law if we are to pretend any longer to be a civilized country. Everyone recognizes that in wartime, uh, the ordinary rules of civilization are suspended. But uh, if we're going to have a government of laws, then these agencies must operate within the laws. To make sure that they do, the first recommendation of my committee that investigated these scandals was to set up a permanent uh, Senate Oversight Committee with enough power to investigate questionable activities within closed doors, behind closed doors, with enough power to decide when to make given matters public, and with the legislative power to recommend changes in the laws relating to these intelligence agencies. That committee is set up. That's one big step forward. But um, in our discussion of intelligence agencies, we frequently fail to make the distinction between 
what is legitimate intelligence and, and what has come to be called in that wonderfully bureaucratic and bloodless word, covert operations. Uh, covert operations have nothing to do with intelligence. Nothing to do with intelligence. Uh, everybody, I think, would agree that this country must have an efficient intelligence agency. We need to know what's going on in the world. We need to protect ourselves against possible attack. We need to know how large an enemy force may be, may be and where it may be moving if it constitutes a possible threat to the United States. Uh, we couldn't conduct an informed foreign policy without an efficient intelligence agency. Everybody recognizes that. Um, but covert operations have nothing to do with collecting information. Uh, they have to do with uh, manipulating events abroad through secret interventions in foreign lands for the purpose of uh, coercing certain things to happen that we think will serve the immediate interests of the United States. And the real controversy has to do with whether or not the United States should continue to secretly intervene throughout the world to coerce events uh, and to get away from that sterile uh, bureaucratic language that so benumbs the brain. Uh, when we talk about covert operations, what are we talking about? We're talking about assassination. We're talking about kidnappings. We're talking about false propaganda. Uh, we're talking about uh, altering the health of leaders that have become a nuisance to the United States. Uh, we're talking about uh, fake pictures. Um, designed to show leaders in compromising situations in order to undermine uh, the respect for them in their own countries. We're talking about bribery and coercion. We're talking about all the black arts of the bag of, of uh, dirty tricks that we've learned from the KGB. Now, the question is, do we want to be like the Russians? Is this our value? Is there no difference between our society and theirs? I had always thought that it was the difference that, that made the struggle worthwhile. And if you look at what we've accomplished with the uh, you know, sort of indiscriminate intervention into the affairs of other countries as we've adopted these techniques and uh, applied them as our own compared to what we've lost, I think we've paid too high a price. We've lost the great moral force that we once exerted in the world, as peoples in other countries find it more and more difficult to distinguish between the United States and Soviet Union. How do you recommend uh applying this to the agencies. Would you dismantle them and then form them again, form new agencies? Uh, would you simply work on new regulations within the in, uh, uh, individual agencies? Well, what I would do, I, I, I had a good committee. My committee made many recommendations uh, uh, that, that, that I think will be uh, enacted into law in the next session of the Congress, and I'm very proud of it. But my committee uh, has didn't want to go very far in questioning covert operations. Um, I think that the committee contented itself with saying that we ought not to engage in so many covert operations and we should do so only when our national security interests uh, made it necessary. Well, those, that, those are vague terms. Um, I would take covert operations entirely out of the CIA. When the CIA was set up, nobody had the foggiest notion that it was going to involve itself in covert operations. It was to be an intelligence agency. Nothing in the debate in Congress suggests that Congress ever intended that it should engage in covert operations. Nothing in the law, except some boilerplate language that they now point to. And yet, soon after the CIA was established, uh, all of the wartime habits of the Office of Strategic Services and the personnel that were transferred from that wartime office to the CIA took over. And covert operations soon became the dominant uh, work of the CIA. 
Um, so now you have a whole regiment of people who are experts at the, these, these um, methods, strong arm methods of getting things done in other countries. Um, the capability is there, available to the president. And oh, it takes a strong president to resist using that capability when he's told that this problem can be settled. It may be a little country that doesn't matter too much, but we have certain interests here and we can get this settled quietly and no one will know the difference. A uh, few people can be removed. What a corrupting thing that that is. To, what a corrupting temptation. And uh, there they sit, getting their campaign ribbons, uh, earning their promotions uh, by their exploits, figuring out what to do next and where. Now, I would take it out of the CIA, and I would uh, put that big regiment of cloak and dagger men on pension. And then I would have a little discreet agency uh, in the Department of State because I recognize there are times when you might have to engage in a covert operation to avoid a nuclear war, uh, to protect truly vital interests of the United States. From time to time, you might have to do it. That's what I would do. But I think the country is so far gone on the notion that we must do these things because the Russians do them. We must behave the way the Russians behave. That um, I doubt very much that uh, this will ever happen. I, I think the agency is there, the capability is there, and uh, presidents will be few and far between who do not use it. Senator Church, before our next question, I think it is very important to the viewers to know that this program was taped in late October prior to the presidential election and is being shown to the viewers following those election results. And we're unfortunate at the moment that we don't know those results. But that, that's why I said, if we have a new administration. <laughs> so, so we're at a disadvantage. We don't know the results at the time we're taping the program. Right. Uh, let's move into domestic issues and the question of the economy. In recent years, we've had a serious inflation, although it's declined recently. We have a very high unemployment rate. Uh, we've had some problems with the gross national product uh, rate of growth. Uh, and many people are discussing it, certainly Governor Carter and President Ford during this campaign. Uh, as a senator with uh, many years of seniority and, and you have dealt with the economy, what do you think uh, programs uh, could be used or what would you advocate as programs that would get us on a, a much faster uh, uh, rate of recovery of this problem. Of, also, I, I am not an expert in economics, but I understand one of the few times in our history that we've had both inflation and unemployment uh, to this extent at the same time. Uh, what do you propose for a solution to this problem? Well, I, I generally think that we have to put the country back to work. And the more rapidly we can put it back to work, the better. Uh, that will bring the, the budget back into balance. That will reduce the um, inflationary pressures that deficit spending causes. Um, when we hear it said that we can't afford to put people back to work, I wonder why we don't recognize the terrible cost of having them unemployed. Every time uh, the unemployment level in this country goes up 1%, it costs the governments federal, state, and local, $17 billion in lost taxes, plus billions more in expanded costs for welfare, unemployment compensation. And uh, we'll never balance the budget if we have 7 or 8% of our people unemployed. Remember that uh, President Nixon and uh, Ford, for all of their talk about being conservative in business uh, types, who believed in fiscal responsibility, these were the two presidents who sent to the Congress uh, the, two, the, the, the presidential budgets with the greatest deficits in history. The biggest deficits ever sent to Congress came from these two presidents. And that's because the economy was in such bad state, deficit spending became necessary to try to pump back the economy 
whether there's a Republican or Democratic administration in, in Washington, they're all Keynesians now. This is the accepted economic um, way to, to bring a country uh, or, or an economy back onto even keel in a, in a period of recession. So I would say bring it back as fast as possible. Put people to work as fast as possible. Then you'll get your revenues and reduced costs on welfare and all the rest. You'll bring your budgets back into balance, and that in turn will reduce the inflationary pressure. Um, to prolong the process seems to me to make no sense at all, considering uh, the human side, the, the terrible um, problem that faces so many millions of our people who can't find work and who want to work. Uh, I, I favor the Carter view, and I, I think that uh, as compared to the Ford view, uh, both are really simply talking about how fast do we move. That's all. Two Keynesians, one who's half persuaded, the other who's wholly persuaded. I would move uh, more rapidly. Senator Church, I don't know how burning an issue China is, but maybe you could shed some light on it for us. This is <laughs> certainly terribly intriguing to have since Mao's death, his widow captured in the Forbidden City. And, and so here we are left not knowing if these moderates actually are going to make a difference in both the, the policy towards us. I think perhaps my question would be more, do you see if, if there really is going to be a moderate uh, modernization in uh, China, would this make a difference in their relationship? with Russia, and we have perhaps come to rely upon this rivalry between Russia and China, uh, a friendlier regime with, with Russia from within, within China might make a difference. Could you shed some light? Well, I'm afraid I, I can't shed very much because it's hard to know um, who is finally going to come to the top in China. You'll remember that after um, Khrushchev um, well, even before that, after Stalin's death, uh, there were a series of, um, of leaders in Russia that took charge of the Russian government for only a short period of time and then were displaced by another faction. Um, and I think that could happen in China. You might have a series of factions before the political situation stabilizes again. Uh, my guess would be that um, the policy toward the United States would remain pretty much the same. It makes sense for China. Uh, it's possible that uh, a new group would uh, attempt to normalize relations with the Soviet Union. Um, that will be difficult for China and Russia to do. Since we tend to think as ideologues in this country, just the way the Marxians do, uh, we think that because both these countries are Marxist or communist, that they should be natural bedfellows. And there are some Americans, I'm sure, that still believe that uh, the fighting that has gone on, the, the occasional skirmishes along the Chinese and Russian border are uh, simply manufactured to, uh, to, to fool the Western world. But the truth is <laughs> that these two countries have serious border problems, serious historic problems, and the suspicion uh, that the Chinese have toward the Russians is very real and very deep. And uh, it has nothing to do with the Marxian philosophy. It's, an, it's a nationalistic feeling uh, of the Chinese against the Russians. So it's going to be difficult to, for them to, to normalize their relations or to regain confidence in one another no matter which faction comes to the control of the new Chinese government. Meanwhile, I think it would serve our interest uh, to try and proceed with uh, normalizing our relations with China and uh, exchanging ambassadors, finding a way to um, handle the, the dilemma that is presented to us by ta Taiwan. Uh, you can't, uh, you know, ford a river and get out into midstream and then just stop. And we're in midstream. We should continue to ford the river. And I think that that will be possible with whatever new Chinese government emerges. Dr. Wright. 
Senator Church, if I thought it would do any good, I'd ask our good moderator over here to extend this program for another hour so we can get into some of these burning issues that I think the people would like to, uh, to hear about. But I've got a pick, and I'm going to pick energy because that's one that's, uh, that I'm very concerned about. Uh, to say that the oil, the Arab oil embargo of 1973 was upsetting to our country is probably a, a gross understatement. And the fact of the matter is that we're even more dependent by a sizable amount on Arab oil right now than we were in 1973. We still do not have a national energy policy. And uh, I'm wondering what you think is likely to, uh, to occur as far as the Arabs go with their oil oil pricing policy and their, you know, their willingness to continue to sell us oil at the same rate or an increasing rate, and do you think we'll get a national energy policy out of any administration? Well, it remains to be seen. Uh, Project Independence is uh, perhaps is a farcical, uh, a, uh, a declaration as ever emanated from the White House. I remember all the hoopla when Nixon declared that we were going to be independent. Project Independence was the name of the game. And then we were importing a third of our oil from foreign sources, and now we're importing almost half of it. There's only three years have passed. I mean, how can you lose a battle at a more disastrous and calamitous rate than that? Uh, now, what can a new administration do about it? Uh, what, what can next year bring? I don't know. Uh, Member Carter says that if there's another uh, oil embargo, uh, he will treat it as a declaration of economic war and he will cut off the export of all um, commodities, uh, weapons, uh, food, whatever it is we sell to them. Well, that might be a sufficient deterrent, but then again, it might not, because these countries are so wealthy that they can buy elsewhere in the world. Uh, we're becoming increasingly dependent upon them. And the only alternative is, uh, is to ask the people uh, to stop using so much fuel. Ask them for real sacrifices, which takes very strong leadership, and, and uh, we'll have to wait and see. We're going to have to cut back on fuel consumption in this country if we're ever to get self-sufficient. And we really have to move ahead with our alternatives. Coal, nuclear, thermal, uh, uh, geothermal, solar, uh, all those other sources that will help on the fringes in the hope that we can uh, achieve that breakthrough that everyone talks about, fusion, which is supposed to solve the energy problems for all time. Meanwhile, we're in a very serious pinch, and no matter how hard we try to develop alternative sources uh, without really asking the American people for sacrifices and for a very substantial reduction in their present use of power, we won't solve the problem. And then, when the day comes that uh, the Arabs, who will continue to increase the price, they're already talking about a new meeting to increase the price of oil 10 or 15 percent. They have a complete cartel in control of the price, which is purely political. They say they have to do it in order to pay us for all those arms we're selling them, the price of which <laughs> keeps going up every year. And uh, so anyway, that's the, that's the vicious uh, cycle, as uh, we ratchet ourselves into further inflation by our own policies. Uh, until we begin to face these basic facts and talk about them honestly, and until our leaders begin to say to the American people, tighten your belts, because uh, otherwise we're going to be the victim of uh, the decisions of foreign governments and a terrible crisis could be created that would bring this country to a halt, a paralysis upon us. Um, the problem isn't going to be solved. Janelle Berg. As a United States Senator, you've been in a 
particularly good position to view the opinions of Americans over the past several years. Do you find that Americans are having a swing in opinion with regard to the amount of government intervention in their lives that they wish? There, a few years ago, there was always requests for more programs, uh, particular kinds of government services. Now there seems to be a swing away from this. And particularly, would you speak to the uh, area of revenue sharing? Yes. Um, I think that some government programs um, have been adopted that have had a profound effect upon public opinion uh, because um, the federal government has reached too far. Uh, take, for example, uh, OSHA. There's lots of nonsense about OSHA, and I know that uh, it's, it's such an emotional issue that it's used for political exploitation all the time. Um, but if you want to talk sense about OSHA, then you'd have to recognize that the OSHA law, insofar as it regulates conditions of work in large manufacturing plants and big businesses, it's, going to, it's here to stay because of the tremendous number of accidents that used to occur because of unsafe conditions. And then thousands of American families with the bread earner dead in some kind of accident at his place of work uh, had the younger children and the widow sustained on Social Security at public expense for the next 20 or 25 years. So we're going to have some kind of federal regulation over conditions of work. But when you try and extend such a law so far that it, get, that it establishes the working conditions and the safety requirements in every mom and pop store and on every family farm, gone way too far. And the next step is to come into our private homes where we assume the responsibility for the safety of ourselves and our children and say, oh, but you don't meet federal guidelines. That $500 fine, here you 14 violations in the kitchen, <laughs> 12 <laughs> violations in the living room. <laughs> well, you see, I mean, there's a, there's a place where you have to call a halt, a reasonable line to be drawn. And I have believed that the reasonable line is that those businesses that are essentially an extension of the family ought to be left out. Family farms ought to be left out. And uh, mom and pop stores, little businesses with just a few uh, employees that are essentially family businesses should be left out. And um, so that we're, we're moving in that direction. That, that's the way we can clean up these laws because we have, I think, made the mistake in the past of trying to reach further than it is practical for government to go. Now, revenue sharing, uh, it's a good idea and, and, um, and would have been a better idea if it hadn't simply been added on top of everything else. I wish we could continue that. <laughs> the Decentralization the for the future, I think, is the key. Thank you very much. On behalf of the panel, as always, it's been a great pleasure having you, and you have been so informative on a number of issues, and I know our viewers have enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Nice to have been with you. Thank you for your questions. Ladies and gentlemen, be with us again next week at 6 o'clock when we'll be interviewing another personality of the United States, and until that time, good evening. College Public Forum can be seen at this same time each week over this station. The preceding student production was brought to you by videotape recording. <laughs>